I'm Ruffian Tipman, Executive Director of Friends of the Wissahickon. And tonight's virtual Valley Talk is Stopping the Spotted Lanternfly. Before we dive in, I just want to let everyone know that we are recording this. So if you don't want your uh, beautiful face to be on the recording, you should turn your cameras off. If you have any questions for our speaker, we would love you to submit them in a form. And that form is in the chat. So all you have to do is refer to the chat and follow the link for submitting your question. And then at the end, I'll pop back in and pepper Dr. Urban with all of our questions after the, after the talk. So with that, it looks like we have a good amount of folks here now and I'll ask that we get started. So we'll have a little bit of information about who we are, Friends of the Wissahickon. Founded in 1924, we have almost 3,000 members, which is amazing. We work officially in partnership with Parks and Recreation, and we support the conservation of the Wissahickon Valley Park. And we invite you to do that with us by becoming a member or perhaps taking on the challenge of the 2021 All Trails Challenge. You can find all of that information at fow.org and more. There's loads more there. You can also find out how to download the map app which has loads of information and the map. So all of that's FOW.org. All right. Tonight, I'm so happy to have this Valley Talk sponsored by a wonderful company, Prentice Smith. And uh, we got to know Prentice Smith through one of our board members, Ethan Burchard, who is also chair of our governance committee and someone who loves the Wissahickon. And I am thrilled to have Ethan here to talk about uh, why Prentice Smith is interested in, in Friends of the Wissahickon, a little bit about what the company does, which is so socially responsible investing. And then Ethan is going to introduce our wonderful speaker tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ethan. Thanks, Ruffian. Um, just waiting to be unmuted there. Thanks for that nice introduction. Um, I'll be really brief, but I, I did want to just say that um, as sustainable investment managers, we at Prentice Smith, we spend a lot of time evaluating organizations just to understand their environmental, their social, their financial performance. Um, and we're really proud to sponsor FOW because we think this is an organization who's doing outstanding work as measured in all of those categories um, in terms of you know, efficiency and financial performance, um, in terms of environmental performance, certainly um, doing so much work for the Wissahickon. Um, and also perhaps less well known, but, but um, in social aspects too, and in, in really um, opening the park up to everyone and, and working hard to do that. So um, we are, we're really proud to be sponsors um, and thank you to Ruffian and the team for all the great work. Uh, and I also uh, am, have a responsibility to introduce Dr. Urban, who I got to meet um, in pre-calls before this, before this webinar. Um, and I wanna say as a Mount Airy resident and also a parent of spotted lanternfly hunters, I have two of them. They're really good at stomping on spotted lanternflies when they see them. Uh, I'm really glad to be sponsoring this particular talk um, led by a, a true expert in the field. Dr. Julie Urban is a research associate professor in the entomology department at Penn State University, and she earned her PhD in evolutionary biology from the University at Albany. Um, Dr. Urban studies plant hopper evolution and their co-evolution with multiple bacterial and fungal symbionts. And her recent work involves aspects of basic and applied research on the invasive plant hopper, also known as the spotted lanternfly, Lycorma delicatula. Uh, Dr. Urban has been a member of USDA's Technical Working Group of Scientists advising management and research on the spotted lanternfly since it was first detected in the U.S. in September of 2014. Um, and Dr. Urban is the lead PI on a regional USDA NIFA specialty crops research initiative grant studying the biology, management, um, and reducing the impact of spotted lanternfly and specialty crops in the eastern U.S. And finally, before I turn it over to Dr. Urban, I have a little insider tip. She has a surprising and amazing collection of spotted lanternflies, perhaps right at her side that you should ask her about in the Q&A because it's fun to see. Dr. Urban, uh, really looking forward to the talk. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm really happy to be with you all tonight. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can you see that all? All right. Okay, great. So hi, I'm here to talk with you about stopping spot and lantern fly. And so I wanted to start out and just give you a bit of a brief um, overview or history of how we got here with spot and lantern fly. And so here, spot and lantern fly, um, as Ethan mentioned, I study plant hoppers. And plant hoppers are like the closest relatives that you're probably fam most familiar with are cicadas. And so plant hoppers, though, are uh, a super family of insects. They're incredibly diverse. There's over 14,000 described species, at least half as many as that undescribed, in 21 families. And so I, I fell in love with plant hoppers for a lot of different reasons. But one of the reasons you see here is because their body forms or morphology are so incredibly diverse. And so while our spotted lanternfly is certainly a, a, a pestiferous species, um, Lanternflies typically aren't pestiferous, but um, in the top left corner, you'll see uh, this, this little guy. It's about four millimeters long, and this is a, a member of the family Delphacidae, and, and most of the plant hoppers to date that have been studied are um, insects in this group that are major pests of all of the cereal crops of the world. And so when you get an outbreak of one of these rice hoppers in Asia, it can reduce rice production by about 80%. And, and actually it was even thought that um, a corn delphacid that we actually have here in the United States that, that's a pest, it was thought to have contributed to the fall of the Mayan empire. And so, um, but they have a very limited diet. They do something very, very different than spotted lanternflies. And so of these um, 21 different families, spotted lanternfly um, belongs to one family Fulgoridae. Uh, that's where the common name lanternfly comes from. And this is about uh, a family of about 500 species. Mostly they're tropical and really not, you know, all of them are not pests except for spotted lanternfly. And so where the name uh, lanternfly comes from is if you, if you look at this, the way you can tell um, a plant hopper, as you see, if you can see my cursor here, this is the insect's eyes. And right beneath it, that little knob um, is the base of the antenna. So they hold their bristle-like antenna beneath the eye. And many lanternflies have this prolonged and empty head process. And it was thought that that, uh, that head process um, harbored bioluminescent bacteria, hence the name lanternfly. It's, uh, it's been tested, no, they don't, but it's just a name that seems to have caught on, but they're not flies at all. In fact, if you look at our spotted lanternfly and turn one of these over, you can see that um, this is a female. You can tell by these, this last abdominal part is red. Um, and you can see that the mouth parts are fused into a straw-like beak that lays along their belly, which places them in the order Hemiptera, and they're flowing feeders. And so they have these piercing sucking mouth parts. And what they do is they insert them into the plant and they feed on the plant sap. Uh, they'll feed on primarily phloem, which is, uh, contains the products of photosynthesis, contains their carbohydrates, but they'll tap into the upcoming water supply, which is the xylem as well. And so how did lanternfly get here? Um, most sap feeding insects uh, are, are will, because their offspring, when they they hatch out of their eggs, they need to go through a series of molts and those nymphs don't have wings. And so they're thought to, they typically can't move very far. And so it's usually a safe bet if you're a sap feeding insect to lay your eggs on or near a host plant where your offspring can easily feed when they hatch out. Well, apparently lanternflies didn't read that literature and lanternflies, not just our spotted lanternfly, but this is typical of all of the multiple species in the family Fulgoridae, even in their native range in the tropics where they're not a pest and they don't occur in high abundances, they tend to lay their eggs pretty much on anything. And so you can he see here, these are spotted lanternfly egg masses um, laid on stone. And so based on where it was first detected, um, we're pretty sure that lanternfly got here from Asia, most likely China, but we're working on the genetics to figure that out more precisely, um, that it was laid on a shipment of stone 
uh, that was imported into a landscaping business. And so it was either laid on the pallet or on the stone itself. And because they look like these mud-like smears, it's, it's really hard to detect them. And so here you can see the egg masses. Again, these are laid on a tree, but they're very hard to detect. And so when lanternfly was first detected in September 2014, uh, we think that um, based on the numbers that year, um, it was likely here two years prior to that. And so it was first detected in Berks County, just in six townships. And you can see, um, and immediately those um, townships were quarantined. And within, um, within less than a month of that first detection, the USDA pulled together a, um, a work of a scientific working group um, of folks from around the country and some folks in China, and this included, included me, uh, to help advise um, them on the biology and management of lanternfly. And actually that was like a couple of years before I had the opportunity to come to Penn State. So I was working in North Carolina at the time. And, um, and so basically you can see then um, the next year the quarantine grew to include several more townships, but it's still a pretty small distribution. Um, and it extended into three counties. And then in 2016, it expanded a little bit more. And then you can see in 2017, it really expanded to be much more regional. And I had the opportunity to start working at Penn State in 2016. And so my first field season here was really 2017. And um, in that winter, just early spring 2017, um, we weren't surprised, you know, uh, I mean, I, to see this big expansion of the quarantine in this year, we saw it coming in a sense. And basically what we saw here, this was a picture that we took in a vineyard in March 2018 or 2017. And my student, at uh, my doctoral student was working at the time with uh, the now re retired great viticulturist. And we were, we were surveying this vineyard to try to figure out what, um, where we could do some insecticide trials. And we were you know, driving through, pouring down rain, and we saw these are the posts supporting the vines and they were just slackered with egg masses. We saw this on post after post. And we had never seen this before. They had been working in this vineyard for you know, two years prior. And we thought, uh-oh, this is looking really bad. And then uh, later she took, my student took this video and we saw them in incredibly high numbers on grapes. And so if you haven't seen this up close, good for you. Um, but basically what you can see here is they're feeding very voraciously and you can see they're squirting out their excrement, which because it's so sugary rich, we call it honeydew. And you can get a sense it's just dripping off the, off the grapes, it's dripping off the, the leaves and it's dripping off the other lantern flies. And so we saw these very, very heavy infestations in that same vineyard, which were particularly alarming. Um, but in that particular vineyard, um, that grower actually grows um, tree fruit as well. And we, again, uh, my student had been working there for several years, years up until this point, and we had never seen lanternfly on anything really other than the grapes. And then in fall of that year, it was actually September 11th, uh, we saw this. And I was there for this. We saw them moving en masse onto grape, onto apple. And they were actually feeding. So you could see them put their mouth parts in and excrete some honeydew. And this was absolutely terrifying. And so hi, little guy, insult to injury, walking across the camera here. And, and so at, at that time, the USDA called an emergency meeting. Uh, there was, you may, some of you may have remembered, there was a, um, a, a state um, hearing of the, of the House, state house and Senate on lanternfly. But this is when, um, the whole state essentially really mobilized. And so just to give you another video here, um, in that late season when they move into high numbers to feed out other food sources, you can see um, things like this, right? So this really got people's attention and, and freaked them out, right? And so um, the quarantine has continued to expand as lanternfly distribution has expanded. And this is an updated map from just today. The New York State IPM keeps an updated map. And you can see here, lanternfly now has established populations in 10 states in all states that are contiguous to um, Pennsylvania. Those are the blue regions. And then the purple regions are where there have been detections, but no established population 
um, found. And so you can see this is a really good hitchhiker. Uh, in addition to popping up, and again, we have much more, many more places in North Carolina. This is, these are pretty recent. Um, Lanternfly has been detected in, um, on cargo planes in California at least seven occasions last year, also in Oregon and in Washington. So everybody's on, on really high alert for this pest, especially in grape growing regions. And so we see it doing damage to grapes. And so this is another vineyard. This is outside of Allentown. You can see them in high numbers moving in, especially um, in, in the fall and September and October as they're adults. And this is what that vineyard looks like where we saw the egg masses on the posts years back. All 40 acres were killed. Certainly there were likely other contributing factors, but a lot of this was attributed to lanternfly. And so it's absolutely devastating to grapes. And the problem here is that, you know, a lot of insecticides, which I'll share with you, easily kill lanternfly, but the lanternfly, um, because they need to feed heavily in the late season, which is something I'm researching, they move into these areas and you can use an insecticide and knock down a bunch, but they keep coming in. And so this looks like berries or, you know, grapes on the ground. Those are all dead lanternfly. And so it almost looks like they're mulching with lanternfly, yet they keep coming in. And so even though we saw these high numbers that were really alarming on apple and stone fruit, um, to date, we have no records of damage for tree fruit, which is great. They'll come in and they'll feed for as much as three weeks, but then that's it. Again, no recorded damage. So that's really good. Um, but in addition to vineyards, the other place we were seeing damage is they just get into things. And so here we see in nurseries, even though they don't feed on conifers, so they're not feeding on this particular plant, but if they get in and any life stage um, can't be uh, sold to another state. And so um, basically you have um, these nurseries who don't wanna export, especially to states that don't have lanternfly, um, nursery products that have lanternfly in them. And I, I'm sure you all are aware of the issues with, with permitting and um, quarantine and whatnot. But we see nurseries having uh, being hit with the economic cost of trying to better manage, um, better manage their shipments uh, in order to keep, keep lanternfly out of their stock. And also the other places we're seeing it, because they excrete this uh, sugary honeydew, it's a substrate for sooty mold growth. And so in terms of long-term impacts, if you've been in an understory where lanternfly are feeding above, you can see that it's really devastating to those understory plants. And so we're concerned about what that might mean over the long-term in terms of um, turnover, but also many of these understory plants are food sources for, for wildlife. So that's not, not great. And so um, starting in 2017, we kind of got our act together and tried to organize. We had research going on with various members of the technical working group and, and farm bill funding, uh, funding particular projects, um, USDA funding individual projects, but we organized uh, to pursue this uh, specialty crops uh, grant. And we didn't receive it the first year, but we, re we received it the second year. And we asked for $7.3 million and we had to produce uh, dollar for dollar matching. And so what I was really pleased with is that because of the relationships we have at Penn State and also in particular uh, Virginia Tech and USDA have with growers in their region, growers committed to us um, use of their land and we were able to use that as matching value. And so we have, I have uh, 37 researchers and extension educators in all of these institutions. And we're working on a variety of approaches. So how are we stopping the lanternfly? Our three objectives on this grant are, you know, quantify SLF impact on specialty crops and immediately develop management tactics. So, so basically come up with a short-term solution, fix it. What are the chemicals we need to, to apply to try to save growers crops and to try to keep homeowners from, you know, going crazy. Objective two is how do we do, you know, can we do the long-term um, management, the long-term management that are much more sustainable, non-chemical based um, options require us to better understand the biology of this insect. And then the third objective is to communicate this. 
And so um, before we got funding for this grant, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has provide, has and continues to provide us with resources to come up with these immediate management solutions. And so where, where I am at University Park and where my colleagues who are at the Fruit Research and Extension Center, where they do the insecticide trials down in Biglerville, they're not near the quarantine zone either. So in order to test insecticides and see what was effective in killing lanternfly, we had to come up with some home base. And so Dean Rausch suggested put the call out to the Commonwealth campuses and Penn State Berks ponied up and essentially let us establish um, a, a spotted lanternfly field station there on their campus. And we continue it to that day now. We It started with um, 500 potted peach trees that first year and 250 grape trees. And we tested a variety of compounds, but we now have you know, many more hundreds of potted plants and then actually trees and grapevines and other crops in the ground there that we continue to, where we continue to perform our research on spotted lanternfly. And so results of those trials, we've published in peer reviewed journals, but those and continuing studies that you know, we've been running every year since immediately form the basis of fact sheets that are available on the Penn State Extension lantern, uh, spotted lanternfly site. So if you wanna go and figure out how to respond to your lanternfly problems, this is our main clearinghouse. And, and folks in um, the researchers, I'm not an extension person, but researchers, basic and applied extension, the communications and marketing folks from the college and the Dean, we meet every Friday to talk about these problems and make sure we're keeping this updated. And so here in terms of stopping spotted lanternfly, where I just wanna go is give you a sense of some of the more um, basic biology research we're working on to try to come up with ways to more sustainably control lanternfly over the long haul. And so you're familiar probably that lanternfly goes through a series of molts and goes through a series of, of life stages. You have three instars that are these little black um, guys with white spots, a fourth instar that's red, and then the adult stage. And so if we look at how that's distributed over the calendar year, um, they only go through one generation a year. And, and while that's great that they don't um, reproduce more quickly than that, this kind of contributes to the problem. Because they can lay their eggs anywhere in that egg stage, those eggs can move far um, in the course of the eight months where they exist. And then the nymphs feed on an incredibly broad range of plants. And so what you find is that um, they're widely distributed in the environment. And so it's often challenging to detect where they are. No, no plant hoppers have been known to produce a, a pheromone or a, a chemical um, signal in mating. They use substrate borne vibrations. So lures don't work with these guys. So it's kind of hard to do monitoring on them. And then um, what they like, because they feed on over 100 different species of trees and plants, what they like is kind of relative to what's around. I mean, they like uh, tree of heaven, but tree of heaven tends to senesce at about this time of year. And so it's a free for all because they need to feed and they move on to other things. And so it's hard to, they're hard to predict where they're going to move and what they're going to feed on. And then in this late season, which is, I'll show you, um, they feed very, very voraciously for the four months that they're adults, which is a long time. And so some of the research on lanternfly has tried to predict where it could um, persist, where it might spread to. And here's a model from the literature, and this is based on overwintering temperature of the eggs, what areas would allow the eggs to persist. Um, and so looking at eggs, um, that student that I mentioned, she did a series of, of field and um, lab studies where she reared lanternfly eggs at different temperatures and recorded how long it took them to hatch. And here you see, she validated it with field data. You can see when the lanternflies first hatch, they're white. Happy birthday, little guys. And so with that, then um, we developed a model to predict when lanternfly eggs emerge. And so even though they're not everywhere in the country, that's the basis for a model uh, such that, you know, when, when folks who have lanternfly showing up in airplanes in California, they ask me, Julie, when should we go out? We don't have resources to deal with lanternfly. When should we go out and scout to see if those adults laid eggs? Well, here you can put that the date into the model and based on growing degree days, you can predict what proportion of your population would have hatched. 
And so that's a useful tool, but kind of um, what I've been really focused on is this key to understanding the late season movement. And, and this is when lanternflies move from tree of heaven typically into newer areas. This is when you hear them in the news. This is when you see them flying around and, and they tend to be a real big problem that people report. And so adults appear in late July and if tree of heaven is around, they will feed on it. But by September, October, um, before they start to lay eggs, tree of heaven starts to senesce or the heavy populations, you know, all of that feeding has kind of tapped out those trees. So that's when you see them engage in these large flight, flight behaviors. And so here you see, this is, these are two females. We pulled off the legs so that you could see. And you can see the female on the left, you know, granted there's individual variation, but the female on the left was collected just one month earlier than the female on the right. And so that gives you a sense of how incredibly much they need to feed and fatten up. And so this is something that I've been just fascinated with and I'll show you why. Um, going out you know, in the field and taking live weights, you can see that they um, increase over, females increase more than 50% of their mass in just a month. And why I'm interested in this, um, Ethan mentioned in my introduction, I'm, I'm interested in these uh, co-evolutionary relationships with these bacterial symbionts. And so it sounds kind of obscure, but it's kind of neat to see that um, basic and applied really go together. And so here, what I'm showing you is an early season female, you can see she doesn't have much yellow exposed. And because lanternfly feeds on phloem, which is really nutrient poor, it doesn't have am the amino acids in it that the insect needs to survive. Lanternfly, like other sap feeders, tend to have bacteria that they you know, wrap in a cell wall that the insect creates. And these bacteria provision them with um, nutrients from the inside. And so plant hoppers, like other hoppers, actually aggregate all those cells into organs. And so what's kind of cool is you can see these little orange strings. You can't see down here, these little white strings. And then this um, orange structure, which we scientifically call the sausage. Um, these are three different organs that actually are made of bacteria. And so those organs are called bacteriomes and there's three different species of symbionts. And based on um, genome sequencing of these things, because they can't be grown outside the insect, they only persist in the insect. Their genomes have degraded away. Um, to a large extent too. They're making amino acids. And this third one that I'm describing is um, synthesizing lipids and fatty acids. So it's doing a little bit more. But if you look at an early season female, because they're provisioning nutrients, it makes sense right up here, this, all this tube stuff is the insect's digestive tract. It makes sense that it's um, that these are associated with the insect's digestive tract. But if you look at a later season female, one of these larger insects, what you see is that this, these bacteriums start to fade and they dissociate from each other. And essentially what needs to happen is that these bacteria need to get transmitted to offspring and they need to get transmitted to the eggs. And so right there when they're disentangling themselves um, from the digestive tract and moving into the eggs, I'm interested in what are the molecular stages whereby that happens? Because if we could figure out, out a way, perhaps with RNA interference or some way to interrupt that, that would be a control mechanism that's very specific for spotted lanternfly. But also if, you're, if they're putting all of these resources into the bacterial proliferation and their egg development, maybe even that's just a sensitive time period when they might be more prone to even be disrupted by um, chemicals or some lower levels of different um, chemicals acting uh, synergistically. And so that's really what I'm working on. And so you can see I'm looking at identifying the stages of female reproductive development and what I'm learning as, you know, to me, that's really obscure stuff as a basic evolutionary biologist, but I get a lot of calls from USDA saying, hey, Julie, they found a lanternfly in, you know, pick a state, and it's this large, what's the probability that she's mated and she has eggs and they need to worry about an infestation. And so by looking at these areas and relating that to, uh, you know, whether or not they're, um, they're mated. This is what the male transmits a spermatophore when, when they mate. And so I'm looking at um, how this develops over time and developing degree day models of this work. When are they mated? How does re this relate to how large they are? 
and trying to characterize these different stages of female reproductive development to ask a lot of, to try to answer a lot of applied questions. When are they mated? When does egg laying start and end? How many eggs can they produce? You know, and more interestingly here, are there degree day limits on female reproductive development? So when we've looked at this, when eggs occur, in terms of if you're familiar with growing degree days, like when it, you know, when are your tomatoes going to ripen based on what, you know, um, uh, what growing region you're in in the country, you need exposure to a certain number of, you know, kind of temperature units. It's an arbitrary way to predict when biological transitions happen. And so what's interesting is that it takes, you know, 1,150 um, degree days to go all the way from just hatching out as a first dance or nymph to an adult, but it takes them, you know, two thirds of that time again before they're ready to lay eggs. And so if we know that um, egg laying for 50% of the population occurs at, at 2290 degree days, and this is very preliminary, um, and I'm validating it with my dissections, that means that anything over 2290 degree days, anything under 2290 degree days might be areas where lanternfly really can't establish. And so that's that's one of the areas we're, we're working on to try to figure out, are there constraints to female reproductive development that would really inform predictions of, of where lanternfly is going to occur? Also, um, we're also looking at why do they feed on what they do? And so a technology we're working on in my lab is called EPG, electropenetration graph. And here you can see we have wires and electrodes hooked up to a plant and, and basically the electrical signals coming out like in almost like an oscilloscope kind of fashion, um, we read that. And essentially what you do is here you have your poor little lanternfly on the plant and it's wired up to a gold wire and glued with silver glue. And when it inserts those mouth parts and inside those mouth parts, it has two fine um, hair like stylets that it probes in the plant. Uh, when you run a slight electrical current through it, which kind of sounds sick, right? But um, it'll produce a waveform. And depending on, this has been developed for aphids and leafhoppers and whatnot. And so the you'll get a different waveform depending on whether or not the insect is probing, if it's salivating, if it's feeding on xylem, if it's feeding on phloem, or it's just passively sitting there. And you need to decode this behavior by, you know, killing the insect with the mouth parts in and doing the histology on the plant tissue. And I have a postdoc who has done that for you know 10 years as a technician. So we're working to decode, but once we do that, we can give lanternfly, you can do a lot of things. We can give lanternfly a variety of different plants that it feeds on, like that it prefers more and less. And, and basically what we can do there is then look at plant varieties, for example, grape varieties, where lanternfly isn't able to feed as efficiently and perhaps identify um, uh, different traits in those grapes that would confer some components of resistance to lanternfly feeding. So again, longer term solution, but something that would be a little bit more sustainable. Also kind of a cool thing, um, a, 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 a birder, actually, a, a teenage birder showed this to my colleague who's no longer at Penn State, Heather Leach, and there's a couple of papers that have come from this. Um, spotted lanternfly seem to emit a thermal signature at night, and so you can see those. And so here, this is when we, we have a physiologist in the department who's working with me, and you can see their, their little bellies glow. Um, this is kind of unusual and you usually see infrared signatures in insects when they beat their wings, um, like in, in moths and bumblebees. And so here it's kind of interesting, it's going on in the abdomen. And so other people are interested in using this and, you know, um, developing drones uh, to search for lanternfly. And, and I'm interested in, you know, do only the adults do it? Uh, do they have to have some metabolic, some fat requirement? You know, what are the what are the parameters under which uh, they do emit this this signal? And we need to know a little bit more about it before we can actually use it. But that's kind of promising. And then just to mention, there's a lot of other research. I'm just giving you the the tip of the iceberg here. But with the um, with the other collaborators on uh, that USDA NIFA grant. We have a grant project website, stopslf.org. And that includes, this isn't, this, Penn State's involved in some of this work, 
Um, but basically we have collaborators, particularly at USDA, ARS and APHIS uh, with folks from Cornell Del and Delaware that are looking at classical biological control. So folks from USDA immediately um, back in early 2015, began expeditions to China to look for parasitoid wasps that lay their eggs in lanternfly. And so they have, um, this is an Anastata species that they've brought back, they're working on in their quarantine facilities um, to determine if it's specific to lanternfly. So far it hasn't seemed to be, but again, there's two different subspecies with this particular parasitoid wasp, so it's complex, but they do have a promising nymphal parasitoid. You can see here, this is uh, the parasitoid that laid its eggs and it's developing in the nymph and it blows it out. Um, and then there are some parasitoids that are, are already here that are parasitizing lanternfly eggs, but in, in really low, um, in low frequencies, not really enough to do much. And then we have folks at Cornell that are looking into um, fungal pathogens that seem to attack lanternfly. And so again, biological control options being some potential long-term solutions for us. So with that, that's kind of giving you the tip of the iceberg. Um, somebody told me the spermatophore looks like baby Yoda and, and now I cannot unsee that. So I thought I would share that with you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Urban. We've had some questions that have come in. I think one of them, you just touched on the answer, but um, are there any, you, you mentioned the, the predator uh, biologic, natural biologic control researching something from China, but are there any predators or diseases right here in the mid-Atlantic that might help us out? <laughs> Actually, that that's what folks that's what the folks from Cornell are doing. They they have and I think they they have a, a a wanted poster uh, that's on the Stop SLF page. But they're basically saying if you see any spotted lanternfly that's attacked by these fungal pathogens, put it in ethanol and send it to us because that's what they're trying to sequence and identify if that's the case. There was one that they did detect and wrote a paper on Betcoa major and it was an undescribed species that they identified a few years ago, but it was, you know, we had a particularly heavy rain, rainy, heavy amount of rain that year, and it was kind of in a geographically localized area, so, eh, you know, um, but, but again, they're working on that, and what's interesting is that um, in when I read the, went, went back over and read the email from Noah originally um, mentioning, okay, could I speak to maybe some other other invasive species? There was a lot to deal with lanternfly, but I think this provides a good opportunity to provide a comparison with brown marmorated stink bug, because what I get very frequently is people say that, oh, everything, if people were so freaked out about, about brown marmorated stink bug, it was such a problem, and then suddenly the numbers, it's, it's kind of died down. You know, it's 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 gotten in check. You know, is that going to be the case? Do they presume that's going to be the case with lanternfly? And so, while I hope so, um, one of the reasons that uh, we think that brown marmorated stink bug isn't as much of a problem is because there's a complex of six or seven other native stink bugs that are pests here in Pennsylvania. And so they've co-evolved with parasitoids that hit those stink bugs. And so they already had those parasitoids here. So it wasn't a really big deal for one of those to just move on to brown marmorated stink bug. And so that, and I think that um, certainly the samurai wasp um, was another that was brought in that was found to already be here. That that's what we attribute that knocking down of that population um, Mm. what did it, we don't really have anything close to lanternfly here. This is a, a really, you know, unique insect and not in, doesn't occur in high numbers or outbreak. So I'm a little less optimistic that anything, that there's any going to be any one thing that really takes care of it. Okay. Um, I do have a question here that people are noticing fewer lanternflies this year. And, and what are your thoughts on that? And do we think it's a trend? <laughs> Should we uh, <laughs> I, this is we, boy, we spent a lot of time talking about this with Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and USDA. Uh, yes, there are certain areas and, and areas where I need to go and collect thousands every week for my field trials. I can't find them, right? So, so certainly I noticed them, and but. 
Then there are other areas just maybe half a mile away where they're still just crawling with it. Right. And so, um, so what we, so hopefully it, it will be a trend that continues, but given as much as spotted lanternfly is expanding through the nation, I'm, I don't think it's the time to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, the other part of that is that they're so patchily distributed anyway, that that's really problematic. They tend to feed really heavily in some areas on for two or three years, they seem to kind of tap out those trees and then they move off. Will they come back in a few years once those trees have had the opportunity to come back a little bit? That's what we've we'll been seeing. We'll wait but, and see, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That they don't come back anywhere, <laughs> but it seems unlikely. Um, I have a question here. Let me just scroll. Someone is asking, where are mine coming from? I don't mean which country. They seem to come from elsewhere to my property. In 2020, I killed almost all I saw every day, except, except those high on a walnut tree, but more would show up the next day. Do they like to fly to other areas? Or were they coming down from the walnut trees? To the grapevines where I could kill them. And this yeah. is what makes them. Where were they what, coming from? <laughs> this is what makes them so hard to study, yeah. right? And and to control because they're constantly moving. We think that they need a diverse diet to to be able to um, be reproductively fit. And so to date, nobody's been able. You know, we nobody really has been able to grow them well in a colony. We have a colleague <laughs> in at USDA who has a, a facility. A quarantine facility at Fort Detrick, and she can keep them going. But even you know, in an experiment where they gave them multiple hosts and whatnot, I did the dissections for the females that developed. One of all the individuals who survived in her study to become adult females, one had one egg, one had five eggs, versus the many eggs you get. And, and so even those that um, a colleague in my department, Kelly Hoover, had you know have reared in um, enclosed, uh, like in these enclosures where they built cages around multiple tree species that they planted in an extension agent's yard. Those have gotten to egg laying state, but again, much later than the wild ones. And so, um, so I'm doing dissections to compare what the wild reproductive capability is compared to the captive in these different situations. And they just seem to constantly need to move. And so you do see them one day on your rose bush, the next day on something else. And so um, that's also what makes it really problematic to figure out to monitor them for them because they come in from somewhere else. And if it's the first year you have an infestation, like I talked to folks at um, WITF and they're like, they're crawling all over our building. Suddenly they're here. And I'm like, okay, did you see them when they were nymphs? And they said, no. And it's like, well, they were there, right? They were just broadly distributed because they're feeding on so many different things. Oh, and then they all came together. Mm -hmm. And then, and again, they're constantly moving and then they're larger and you can see them when they fly. So again, it's that constant movement. And that's also why we haven't been able to document whether or not the numbers are going down because we have had some sites where we measure the exact same trees weekly, every week for two years, and then they'll just move just over. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, I hear you. They move. <laughs> right. We've got another uh, question here about um, what if you can't control it, and and what's the long term? Is there you know, a long-term strategy, are we also looking at the, you know, they, great plants seem particularly at risk? Are there resistant varieties that are being explored or? We're certainly looking at resistance, like with the feeding behavior, but also um, we have our viticulturists who are looking at um, just trying to determine uh, what, what number of spotted lanternfly um, causes what type of damage in the plant. And so when, when is it that you need to treat, if you need to apply chemicals, when is the best time to do it? And so to date, um, the, only, only, the only plants that it will actually kill outright are grapes and tree of heaven. And so, um, so basically nobody cares about tree of heaven, right? It's a weed invasive itself. For the grapes, what we're trying to do is to work on insecticide impregnated netting or barrier netting also 
um, for the Erie region, we're, we're working with growers there to um, preemptively remove tree of heaven around vineyards to prevent it from establishing. So working on those buffer areas is, is what we're trying to do and come up with other solutions for vineyards. But in terms of people's yards, while it's very annoying, um, it, they, it won't kill your prized maple. It'll be a stressor, but I'm a little bit more concerned about people um, trying to preventatively treat first lantern fly before it's there. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you've noticed you, you can have, you know, multiple species or multiple trees of silver maple in your yard and they will really, really like one mm -hmm. and you'll get thousands and hardly any on that same tree species near it. And so what we found with, we've documented that and we found that they tend, those trees that tend to be heavily fed upon or like we call them hot trees, um, tend to be higher in nitrogen values. We're also looking at, are they emitting different volatiles that make them attractive? Mm. And so that kind of thing, what is it that makes lanternfly choose some things over others? And we're trying to figure out how we can, once we can hone in on that too, that can allow us to really better manage things. So we're getting, we're trying to get that pattern. So I think this, this next question builds on that a bit. And um, our questioner is asking about Kind of the impact to our native ecosystems um and you just kind of cautioned against preemptively treating you know your your prize maple in your yard but um i know a little you said also though that the um what the what the bugs are excreting is uh impacting understories so do you have any insights or to talk on that a bit yes so actually um what what is promising is that they don't seem to penetrate into forested areas very, very much. They're very much an edgy species, like okay. like brown marmot and stink bug. And so, you know, we were really worried: are they going to damage the timber industry? Are they going to really wreck our natural forests? And it really is more the edges. And so, there, if it can be just managed in the edges, especially where you have wildlife corridors and whatnot, and just take care of it there. I think that it's it's not one of the things we're we're doing is also looking at how well they feed and survive and damage other crops because we had this was an invasive in south korea and all the literature was like oh it's this devastating pest to timber to you know tree fruit and whatnot and then and so we sounded those alarms here and we needed to to get funding and whatnot but then when you really look in detail at that literature they didn't document the damage very well mm. And so we're doing studies and we're kind of pulling back. So we're saying like, no, you know, really we've been studying tree fruit. It's not damaging to tree fruit. It's not penetrating forests. It's not quite as bad across the board as we originally thought. Um, I, I have a last question, I think. And one of that is, you know, you've mentioned kind of your objectives as outlined in the grant and the short term and the long term. And I'm just always curious how long the long term is. <laughs> All right, so as an evolutionary biologist who used to do very <laughs> basic research before I came into this land, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that in terms of, I think we're getting there in terms of having better models to inform when to manage, when to intervene, and when to look for it. So I feel like we're coming up with some really practical solutions besides just chemical insecticides, like now and in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. In terms of biological control and releasing, you know, some foreign agent, you know, like foreign parasitoid, that's still going to be a number of years off, maybe five years off. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, but I think that, again, we're not going to have one silver bullet because it is such a complex pest. So I'm confident that every little bit's going to help. Right. Well, I am so grateful to you to have you on the case. And I'm, I'm sure the rest of the, the country is too, judging from the number of phone calls you get about, ah, we found one. What do we do? How long do we have? <laughs> and isn't it wonderful that uh, everyone kind of rallied together and, and supported that effort? So you have that great data and, and are continuing to collect it. I'd encourage everyone here tonight to check out the website that we've dropped in the chat about the project. And if there's any final thoughts or uh, calls to action you have for us, Julie, we'd love to hear them. Um, no, just um, be aware. Don't, you know, don't take it with you when we say 
when you see it, stomp it. It's more just don't transmit it, right? And, and then the other part is also don't freak out about it. Um, because we, again, we don't want to, especially in urban areas and whatnot, we really don't want to um, overuse pesticides and, right. and things. And so I think that they can't hurt you. They don't kill your trees. So to the extent that you can be, um, be wise and, you know, in how you deal with it, I think, I think, don't worry, it'll be fine. Okay. Hey, I love that. It's going to be great, folks. So, and this talk was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Urban. Thank, Thank you, you to Ethan and Prentice Smith for their sponsorship and our great staff at FOW. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and uh, enjoyed the show. Have a good night.